11 p.m., and the dark heart of winter comes calling. Rolling up against the locked doors and windows of Columbus, Ohio. Inside a frame house, 23-year-old Christina Ruth hears a noise outside and opens her back door. I went ahead and opened the door, and suddenly this person like came into my doorway, and I went to shut the door, and he reached out and like slammed the door open. The man forces his way in, turns out the lights before Christina can get a look at him, and attacks. After three hours, the rapist leaves. Christina dials 911 and is taken to the hospital where semen is collected. As Columbus police work the case, the victim braces for a long investigation. And there just really wasn't much for them to go on. And I knew that even with DNA, it's just like a fingerprint. Unless you have a person to go with that, it, it doesn't help. Within weeks, leads are run down and out, and the case goes cold. Meanwhile, a predator remains at large, walking the streets of Columbus, selecting the time and place for his next attack. In the 12 months since Christina Ruth's attack, five more women have been raped. Each attack centered in the Linden neighborhood of Columbus. Although the rapist tried to hide his face, some of the victims were able to provide the police with the beginnings of a description. Sketches are circulated, and residents warn to be on the lookout for a man now known as the Linden Area Rapist. Investigators believe their suspect will continue to hunt until he is caught. Investigators, however, are wrong. As in the fall of 1992, the attacks suddenly stopped. After nearly two years of terror, the streets of Columbus again grow quiet, and the community begins to relax just a bit. I'm sleeping, and then the next thing I felt was someone leaning on the bed. Just after 8 a.m., Yvonne Merle wakes to a stranger in her bed. I was scared, and then he just threw me to my side real quick and told me not to look, and had a knife. and. And he was real close to me, his face was, and then he had a knife by my throat. After the assault, the rapist walks out the back door, and Yvonne calls police. Detectives step up the investigation, releasing new sketches and ordering a heavier street presence for police. The Linden area rapist, however, continues to stalk and to hunt. Seven more women are assaulted in their homes, and detectives are still without a suspect. Original detectives had linked cases from 1991 through 1992, and a second set from 1994 and 1995, based on geographical proximity and MO. McKee believes the working theory to be sound and uses science to confirm it. So we took the DNA from the first series and compared it to DNA on the second series, and it was determined that they were both the same suspect. Detective John Weeks worked the original set of crimes and believes the timeline of attacks holds a key to IDing the offender. We kind of came to that conclusion that the number of years that he kept disappearing would be consistent with someone being sent off to, to be incarcerated somewhere. A year and a half, six and a half, seven years, those are consistent with prison terms. In Ohio, DNA from felony offenders is uploaded into CODIS a national data bank of DNA profiles. If the Linden rapist has in fact been in prison, his DNA should be in the system. In a criminal investigation, however, should be, doesn't always work out. But we weren't getting any hits. It was, it was kind of the situation where everybody was geared up and we were thinking, well, we're gonna get a hit out of it, and, and we didn't. Detective Weeks takes a call on a sexual assault that has the look and feel of the Linden area rapist. When you looked at the offense on paper and you compared the, the description of the suspects and his characteristics and his behavior and the location he had committed the attack and the method he had entered the home, you felt pretty certain that this was probably this man back again. DNA testing confirms weak suspicions. After seven years of inactivity, the Linden rapist is back. On a Sunday morning, 20-year-old Diana Cunningham wakes up to find a man on top of her, his hands around her throat. You know, he's telling me to shut up or he'll kill me. And 
He had told me that if I opened my eyes, he would slit my throat. The man demands money, then makes it clear he is not going to leave the apartment before he rapes Diana Cunningham. When I just kind of realized that this is going to happen, there's nothing I could do to stop it, um, started crying. Um, at first, he, you know, kept saying, shut up, stop crying, that kind of thing. Although later on, when I cried a little bit, he would, like, wipe my tears away. The man attacks Diana for more than an hour, all the while insisting she keep her eyes shut. There were times when I knew that he could not see my face, that I did open my eyes and try to see anything that I could. Even as she is being raped, Diana Cunningham is collecting evidence, trying to form a mental picture of her attacker for police. During the assault itself, I, I don't know what he thought I was doing, but I kind of felt around on his head, face, arms, you know, found the scar on his arm. And that was another identifying characteristic. I got the bald spot on the back of his head. She also engages her rapist in an almost constant stream of conversation, a ploy she hopes will save her life. I had actually read a magazine article um, from another woman who had been raped in her own home, and, and that was one of the tactics that she had used, and I remembered that. It makes them see you as a person, just any attacker in general. If you can get them talking and open up a little bit about yourself and get them to open up a little bit if it's possible, it, it just helps them to see you as a human being, and it makes it harder for them to attack you, really. It makes it harder for them to hurt you. Diana's strategy seems to work, as the rapist makes it clear he is not going to kill her. On the other hand, he is also intent on not leaving any kind of forensic evidence behind. Basically, he said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to take a shower. And he watched me wash myself to make sure that I did. And while I was in the shower, wiped my apartment for prints, um, actually poked his head in the bathroom to let me know that he was leaving, um, told me to lock the door to keep people like him out. I knew there was a house full of just college students, all guys across the street, and so I grabbed a knife from my kitchen, uh, went across the street, knocked on the guy's door, told him what happened. Uh, they sat with me and let me use their phone to call the police, you know, stayed with me through the whole thing. Columbus police converge on Diana's neighborhood and immediately recognize the work of the Linden area rapist, a man who has eluded authorities for 13 years, a man whose luck is about to run out. Rena Clarkson is a forensic scientist working for the Columbus Police Crime Lab. The first thing she does on Monday mornings is check with a woman who runs the lab's CODIS system. Each weekend, the computer processes any new entries into the data bank and compares them against unknown rape profiles. On Monday, June 7th, the administrator finds a red star beside the unknown DNA profile pulled from the Linden rapes, a series of at least 19 attacks stretching over 13 years. This is the 3138 in the convicted offender profile matching the 3138 in the unknown um, sample. Um, For Rena Clarkson, the forensic hunt is over. The identity of the Linden rapist seemingly established to a scientific certainty. This match was a match at all 13 loci that we look at, as well as the amylogenin, which is the sex of the sample, um, which is the best match that you can get. The profile belongs to Robert Patton, a name detective John Weeks is unfamiliar with. He's a, he's a uh, convicted felon. He'd been in prison 1995. He'd entered the Ohio prison systems. Upon his release in 2001, Patton was required to provide a saliva sample for DNA testing. Unfortunately, that sample sat in a backlog for three years. So he'd been stockpiled somewhere for some reasons that beyond me to explain. And it had never been, um, taken and processed and entered into that indexing system until 2004. In the meantime, Robert Patton continued to rape women. 
I believe the system failed, not advising law enforcement agencies that, yes, we're swabbing your suspects, but we're not running the test from the swabs. And that was never given to us, and that's the failure of the system. Detectives now put their frustrations aside. With a warrant in hand, they pull Patton off the streets and sit him down for some q and I mean, I'm not going to dispute any of them, put kids. Well, right? some of them we know are you, without a doubt. Okay, well, probably maybe all of them is me. Well, I'm not even talking about the burglaries. I'm talking about the other rapes. All right, where are the court tells where some of these other rapes are. That night, Patton hops in a van with detectives and leads them on a tour of a 17-year career in crime. And detectives discover that Robert Patton's penchant for rape is far beyond anything they have ever imagined. It took us to 69 locations, and of those, you know, 39 were the rapes and 30 of them were burglaries. And the list that we were looking at and working from primarily was uh, 17 known rapes. During the drive around town, Patton has graduated from terrorizing women in Columbus, Ohio, to one of this country's most prolific serial rapists, eventually being linked to at least 37 sexual assaults. Weeks deposits him in a jail cell and prepares a long list of charges. When he walked into the courtroom, the first thing he said was, uh, let's get this party started. And he's got this smile on his face, and he's smirking. And the judge asks him, you know, how do you plea? And he smiles and says, guilty as charged. In his first court appearance, Robert Patton has not changed his story a bit. Still fully cooperative and willing to plead guilty to the Linden rapes. The next time he appears in court, however, Patton is singing a different tune. And he said, well, I'm not going to plead anything. I want my trial and I want it today. Despite Patton's confessions, Domus must now prepare for a trial. Seven months later, jury selection is underway when Patton suffers another change of heart. He pleads guilty to 58 counts of robbery and 76 counts of rape and assault and demands the judge give him a lot of years in jail time. At one point, he said 50 years isn't enough. So the judge, after hearing that he wanted more than 50 years, granted his request and gave him 68. I've never had a defendant ask for more time and actually get it from the judge. 